For all you people watching <clears throat> on television, we'd like to invite you to come be with us 1030 on Sunday morning at Antioch and Edgerly. Please come and be with us. Everybody ready this morning? We're going to begin in Ephesians 2.8. Let's all stand for the reading of God's word. Ephesians 2.8, <clears throat> this is what it says. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Father in heaven, we come to you today and just asking you to forgive us of our sins because we've fallen short. We don't try to kid anybody. We don't try to fool ourselves. We know what we are, and we need the blood of Jesus. We need our Messiah to save us and cover us with his righteousness because we don't have any. Father, today bless this word and teach us something we need to know. Help us to better understand and just lead this service now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, the Bible is very clear, folks. It says, for by grace are you saved. And the only thing on your part that has to be done is to have faith in God. Because it's a gift. Now, what do you have to do to receive a gift? Well, I tell you, look, I got something for you. Uh, come on over to the house Christmas and I'm going to give it to you. All you got to do is believe enough to come and get it. And that's how salvation is. I know today there's a lot of religions that teach there's rituals you must go through to go to heaven. Those rituals are not found in the Bible. Today we know there's, there's sacraments and there's all kinds of procedures, all kinds of performances that are done in churches that you must do to go to heaven. But let me remind you that all of these ceremonies and rituals fall in the category of works. And the Bible is very clear there's no work you're ever going to do that will be powerful or essential enough to get you into heaven. One way to get you into heaven, Jesus Christ bought and paid for the tickets with his blood. Now, if you believe he died, you believe he's your Lord, and he rose from the dead, you tell him that with your mouth, and he promises you beyond a shadow of a doubt he will save you. Amen. But today there's people that don't necessarily believe that. I remember one time in kinder I had a family that I had been witnessing to for a long time. And I finally led them all to the Lord. The whole family. And they were so excited. But they had a boy live down the road run into them. And my friend said, man, guess what? I just accepted Jesus. I'm a born again Christian. And the guy said, well, did you get baptized? And he said, no, not yet. Oh, he said, well, you're still on the road to hell, Bubba. Something happened to you, and you're going to burn for eternity. Boy, my friend got all upset and called me. He was frantic. Man, you mean I'm not really saved? That guy said, you lied to me. I said, no, I did not. He said, well, there's a work that I must do. The man flat out told me, I've got to get baptized. Ephesians 2, 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. Baptism is a work. Now, if you are saved and you want to work for God, except you get baptized, God will not use you to do nothing. Because being baptized is the first work we are commanded to do. Not to save you, but to show that you have been saved. Our number one commandment is go out through the world and tell everybody what happened to us. And baptism is just exactly that. There are scriptures in the Bible that people get confused over. And I'm going to read one of them to you now about Jesus talking to Nicodemus in John 3, 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, thee, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter to the kingdom of God. A lot of people think that means you get baptized, then you get saved. That is not at all what that means. That means in order for you to go to heaven, first you had to be born into this world. Mama's water broke. And physically, fleshly, you were born. Then comes a time in your life when you realize that because of the Garden of Eden, you are dead because of sin. And you want to be brought back to life and you want to be quickened by Jesus and the Holy Ghost. So you call upon the name of the Lord and you get reborn a spiritual birth. The first water thing is a physical birth. 
The second thing is a spiritual birth. And it explains this in the next verse. That which is born of flesh is flesh. 1956, my flesh got introduced to planet earth and life. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. 1977, I got born again. That's what that means. Marvel not that I say that you must be born again. It's not complicated, folks, and don't make it that way. Jesus said you have got to have that spiritual birth. And there's only one way you can get it. It's to ask for it and for Jesus to give it to you. You cannot work hard enough. You cannot give enough money. You cannot be baptized enough. You cannot go through any ritual, any ceremony, and expect God to save you when he flat out says there's only one way to be saved through faith. Now, listen to what this says. First Peter explains it. 321. Like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. That word save, if you look it up, is sozio, it's sozo in Greek, and it means to preserve. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. No, our fleshly deeds are not washed away by being baptized. The blood of Jesus is the only thing that can wash your sins away. Well, then what is baptism for? but an answer to a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, anybody can say, oh, I believe in God. You believe in God enough to let me dip you in this tank right here and let everybody see you? Anybody can say, oh, yeah, I believe Jesus died. I, I, I guess he rose from the dead. But do you believe that enough to actually bring a shirt and a towel and get in this tank with me and let me dip you in the ground because that's what it represents and bring you back to life and let everybody see you look like a drowned rat coming out of there. Your $500 hair dude just went down the drain. You see, folks, that's the whole thing. You want to be sure you meant business? Well, did you mean business enough to get baptized because he commands you to do it? I just want to point out today that it does not wash your sins away. It's not for the putting away of our sins. It's an answer to a good conscience. And what exactly does that mean? It means a lot of things. One, you see, the Bible said we're buried with Jesus and we're raised to walk in new life. Well, I can't bury you in the dirt. You'd smother or the worms would get on you. So we use water. You know, it's an element of the earth. And we bury you in that water. And when we raise you up, you're supposed to come up with a different attitude, a different outlook on life. You're supposed to come out of that water fired up about the new you because the other one's buried under there. The old one didn't come up. The new one came up. The old person that liked to do this and you was ashamed of it or liked to do that and you didn't want nobody to know about it or liked to do something over there that was hurting you, robbing you of your joy, taking your victory. When you come out of that water, all them characteristics of that old person should have stayed on the bottom. That's what that means. When Jesus came up out of that grave, he was brand new. And folks, even Lazarus, when God brought him out of the grave, he didn't even stink and the man had been buried for four days because he left it all in the grave. It's important you and I get baptized because God won't use you to work until you do that one thing. If you look at Jesus, Jesus never did anything in that Bible until he got baptized. No miracles, no raising the dead, no healing. But something odd, the Bible said when he got baptized, immediately it said the Spirit of God led him to go do battle with Satan himself face to face. See, Jesus wouldn't have done that prior because he wasn't equipped. Sometime maybe your prayer life isn't answered, maybe you're not equipped. Well, let's look at it. Let's look at what happens. And here's what we're showing when we're coming out of the water in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Now, old things are passed away. And look here. That's what behold means. All things are become new. Well, we know that. When I got saved, I quit hating people. I quit talking bad about people that didn't deserve it. And, I, you know, I, 
I didn't pick up stuff so easily, slip it in my pocket, and man, there was a change in me. My mouth cleaned up and quit cussing and talking like I used to cuss, and things changed because when I got saved, I was a new creature. Well, in order for me to illustrate that, I allowed my pastor to put me in a big tank of water, stick me under, and pull me back up, and this is what happened. This goes on to say, Romans 6, 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Well, it looks like you're being buried. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Don't you come out of that tank acting like you was acting when you went in. Don't you come out of there with that same old nasty attitude. You change your heart. You change your attitude. And you know something? You'll notice you'll get hungry for the Bible and you'll want to hear more about it. You'll notice you've got to pray when things bother you. First thing you do is you think about God. Oh, you're going to see the change because you're a new creature. And now if you just get saved, you'll have a change. But if you're obedient to God and you come and get baptized like Jesus said to do, you'll see a tremendous change in your life and in you. It's true. <clears throat> in Luke 23, 42, he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember that thief hanging by the cross, hanging on the cross by Jesus? I use this all the time because, folks, it's so important. He called him Lord. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. What do you mean come in your kingdom? They're going to be dead in about three hours, both of you. But you see, he believed Jesus was going beyond death. He believed Jesus when he said there's another life, there's another kingdom of which I am king. That thief on the cross knew Jesus wasn't going to die and rot away. He believed what Jesus had been saying, and he made him Lord at the point of death, dying on the cross. Again, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, and that means truly, I say unto you, Today shall you be with me in paradise. That man didn't jump down and go get baptized. I know a lot of people got a lot of different things. They say, well, he didn't have time. Well, the point of the matter is if you get in a car wreck and you're dying on the side of the road and some preacher comes along and you say, Jesus saved my soul, he will save your soul. You don't have to jump down and go do a work. You don't have to come tithe right quick. You don't have to do any of that because Jesus paid it all. Ain't that what the Bible says? And for us to think that we have to add to that is almost sacrilegious because we got to give him the glory. And he plainly said, with your mouth confession is made and with a heart man believes unto righteousness and that is what saves you, not getting dipped in some water. That's for our benefit, something we can touch, taste, smell, and understand that we've been submerged into Jesus like he was submerged in the ground and came out from the dead. But you know what, y'all? Listen to me right here in Matthew 3.13. If it was important enough for Jesus to be baptized, by golly, you and I sure need to do it. Amen. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Well, did Jesus need his sin washed away? Well, he didn't have any to begin with, but he was being obedient to the Father. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and I saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Now, folks, let me clarify something. It was not a dove. It descended and it landed on him like a dove would. A dove will do this a minute before it lands on a post and then it'll sit down real soft on a post. But it wasn't a dove. I've encountered people that won't dove hunt. They won't eat, they won't eat a dove. Folks, it has nothing to do with that. He merely saying the Spirit of God come down is like a dove coming down. That's how he saw it. But nevertheless... That didn't happen to Jesus until he got baptized. It's very important that you and I be baptized in the water. That's very serious. And then, now this is a different verse. Another verse says, immediately he was led up. Then was Jesus in Matthew 4, 1. 
led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. You know, y'all, he was prepared physically, spiritually, to go out into a mountain where nobody could help him, nobody to pray with him, nobody to say, oh, come on, Lord, just a little bit further and it'll be over with. He was all alone. Of course, he had his father with him. It's a lesson for you and I. You might have to go through chemotherapy all alone. Oh, I got my wife. I got my... It don't matter. When they put that needle in your arm and you're in that chair, you're going to be all alone. Unless you got God with you. And then you're never going to be alone. Just like the psalmist says, though I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with me. I'm not going there by myself. But Jesus had that. He had the Father with him so far. And the Father went with him, and he knew that, and he wasn't afraid. Let me tell you something. Jesus, he knew everything that was going to happen to him, but he went into it without fear. Now listen. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was after the hunger. That word hungered right there, it don't mean I like to have a little snack. It means he was the verge of dying. His body was shutting down. You know, you can't go 40 days without a drink of water. I, I assume you know that. You can't go five. You probably couldn't go, oh, maybe 30 days and you wouldn't be able to walk anymore at all. You'd be, you'd be in such weak state. But Jesus was able to do it because the angels kept him alive. When he would have dehydrated and fell down dead, the angels done something to keep him up. So he could suffer a little longer and be thirsty. When he got so hungry, his stomach felt like it was wrong, wrong side out. And believe you me, folks, you go a few days without eating, you'll get weak. You won't be able to move. The angels kept his body in motion. They kept his heart beating and his kidneys a functioning. They kept him going, folks. I'll tell you what. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was starved to death. When the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. First of all, that bread don't mean a loaf of wholesome. That could be T-bone steaks or a shrimp dinner. Bread in the Bible means food. And that devil, he's so slick. He knew Jesus was hungry. He knew he was delirious. But instead of just going right to the bread, first he used a different tactic. If you really were the son of God, you could do that. You know what? I remember I had this old boy work for me one time, and I guess maybe he wasn't too right in the head. I don't know. They had this little pipe about that big around one across the canal. And we'd walk across it all the time, you know, just young people playing around. And this guy got to bragging. He lied all the time. And he got to bragging. I could walk a tightrope and all kinds of stuff. And one of our employees said, well, hey, walk across that pipe right there. The water wasn't but that deep, but it was sewage. And it wasn't no time at all. This old boy was up on that pipe walking across. And it was a long ways. He did all right. He actually did it. But then on the way back, he starts dancing. And I'm thinking, here it comes. Well, no time at all. We had to get down and pull him out of the mud because he went in head first. But the point of the matter is you tell somebody they can't do something, they'll kill themselves trying to do it. I know a lot of people like that. Well, that's what the devil was doing. If you really were the son of God, which I, I know you're not, and you know you're not, but if you really were, well, see, that would have got me. I'll show you what I'll do. I'd have had a smorgasbord there just to show him. See, Jesus is way smarter than you and I. But he hit him two ways, not just one. Even though Jesus was hungry, listen what he says. Let me read this to you. I'm going to read it all again. And a tempter came unto him, and he said, If thou were really the Son of God, the command these stones be made food. But he answered, and he said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Folks, let me tell you something. You and I could go through our lives eating the finest food known to man, and one day you're going to die, and 50 years from now, it's not going to matter what you had to eat because you'll be burning in hell begging for a drink of water. 
What matters is the Word of God. It don't matter what I live in. It don't matter what I drive. It don't matter if I'm dressed in rags. I don't want to be dressed in rags. I don't want to have to walk to church on a rainy day. And God is so good that He blesses us with automobiles and homes and clothes and food. But God wants you to know something. That food and that home and the ritzy stuff we have, don't ever think about trading that in for your eternity burning in hell compared to your eternity in heaven. And that's why he told him, Devil, I'm hungry. But you know what? That food compared to where I'm going to spend eternity makes me where I don't even think about that. Folks, there's some of you in here, I know you're suffering with arthritis. Some of you can't eat a good meal like you would like to. Some of you are on so much medicine that you can just barely make it. It makes you so down and weak. But I'm here today to tell you that ain't none of that matters no more than a loaf of bread. Because one day you're going to be walking on a street of gold. You're not going to have arthritis no more. You're not going to be blind no more. You're not going to be, huh? There won't be no more of that. Because that's all like a loaf of bread. Big deal. It's stale in three days. But not the Word of God. You know, the devil didn't have an ordinary man he was dealing with. He was dealing with somebody who done lived in heaven and done saw the Father. He was the Father in the flesh. But that bread trick just didn't work with Jesus because that's meaningless to him. When I look at the world today and I see people on the job that will stab you in the back to climb that ladder of success, dog eat dog, they don't realize this life is but a vapor. Puff of smoke and it's gone. You're going to give away your dignity and your honor? You're going to give all that away for something that's so venial? No. No, I want to live for God and I want to live by the word of God because that's going to last me forever. And where I'm going is going to be forever. Folks, don't ever forget that. Well, as we go on, again, I want to read just the last part of that. But by every word, every word, not most of it, that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's what I want to live by. Then the devil taketh him up into a holy city, and he setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple. Way up there, man. Rocks all down there, jagged stairs. And he saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Little did the devil know, but the angels were already doing that with Jesus. He was already experiencing them lifting him up. He was dying of thirst and hunger. He was only there because they were lifting him up. But the devil said, if you really are, cast yourself down. Let's see if they do that. Folks, you don't play games with God. And Jesus said unto him, it is written again. You notice something how he always says it's written. That means it's in the Bible. You don't want to argue with people. You don't want to argue with the devil. You just read the Bible and remember what it says. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. In other words, he could have threw himself down. But you know what? You don't play with the miracles of God like that. I've had people t tell me just all kinds of st stupid things over the years, you know, uh, I mean, I just don't even want to repeat them. They're just so stupid. I'll just keep on smoking and make God give God to. You don't play with God like that. You be serious. If you want to try to quit smoking, be serious. If you got habits in your life, be serious about it. I know in my case, I've got to do something tomorrow. I promised my wife tomorrow I'm going to start eating properly again and exercising again because my blood pressure's getting high and my blood sugar's getting high again. And I, hey, this is the temple of the Holy Ghost. I've got a responsibility. And y'all all know me and you know I love to eat. And being a, Caj being a Cajun and knowing how to cook all that stuff, folks, it's deadly and it's hard. But I've got to do what I've got to do. Because I could say, well, if God really loved me, I could eat all the gumbo and boudin I want. 
No, it don't work that way. I've got a responsibility. And I've got to live up to that responsibility. Well, that's how it is. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Well, again, the devil taking him up into an exceeding high mountain. <clears throat> showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Man, he took him up on this mountain. And you could look down at the earth, see all the lights of the cities and all the chariots and their candles burning and all the things going on, the, the majestic earth, man. Now listen where this gets strange. And he said unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. That's the worst one of all because I'm going to tell you why. Jesus knew beyond a shadow of a doubt they were going to scourge him with a cat and nine tails and take every piece of meat off his back. He knew they were going to spit in his face and kick his shin bones. They knew they was going to starve him of water and make him drag that big old wooden cross on his tore up back all the way up Golgotha Hill. And they, he knew they were going to drive them spikes in his wrist bones and his feet and drop him in that hole and hear the meat rip. He knew he would die in a hot sun blistering with his tongue hanging out of his mouth, dying of thirst. He knew all that was coming. The devil said, you don't have to do all that. Drop down to one knee, oh, just one second, and I'll give it all back to you. You've got to understand something. I didn't mean to look like Bernie Sanders there, but you've got to understand something. When we got in that Garden of Eden and ate that fruit, we gave this earth to the devil. He is the God of this world. He's got man's soul automatically. But the devil said, if you just drop down and worship me one minute, you won't have to die on the cross to God. I know you love them. I understand. I want you to have them back. But I don't want you to suffer and go through all that. Give me a little worship time here and I'll give it all back to you. The earth will be a paradise again and they'll all be yours. Well, that sounds mighty good. Well, skip that old nasty cross. Then Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and only him shalt thou serve. And the devil, he leaveth him. Behold, angels came and ministered to him. Folks, <coughs> he told him flat out, I don't worship nobody but God. Folks, you know something? America needs a dose of that. Because today, the Super Bowl Sunday, they're not worshiping God on Super Bowl Sunday. There's so many times now when people put God on that back burner, all our little kids' soccer games and stuff, and practice they're all on Wednesday night so they can't go to church. There's just so much going on to where <laughs> the Lord thy God ain't that important anymore to human beings in this world. It seems that way to some. But he set him straight. And you know, the devil had to tuck his old fart tail and slither away. Folks, stand your ground. Don't ever give in to the devil and compromise what you know is right. I want God's blessings on my life. And if I compromise, I got enough sense to know what that means. I won't get his blessings. You and I know what's right and wrong because the Holy Ghost lives in us. It tells us what's right and wrong. But we must have the courage and the strength to say, Get thee hence, Satan. That means get out of my face, by the way, if you don't know. Took me. But you know, his body was so tore down and deteriorated, the angels had to come and get him started again with their fibrillators, their he heavenly fibrillators, and get him going, jump start him, and Get him something to eat. Boy, I tell you, we fast one day and promise not to drink a cup of coffee and you think somebody's killing us. Compared to Jesus, we don't do too good, do we? But folks, you know what? Today, what I'm, on, I'm just trying to show you is after he was baptized, he went through this. Why? Well, first of all, he was baptized by the only baptism that matters, and that's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The word baptism is the same word as marriage. 
Baptism means a coming together or a mixing up. That's what it means. That's why when you get baptized in the water, you come into the water, you're in the water, you're part of it, then you come out of it. That's just one word. But there's only one baptism, and that's when Jesus quickens you with the Holy Ghost and gives you your life back, and you're born again. That's the baptism that counts. And let me read to you what I'm trying to say in Ephesians 4, 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Well, which one is it? It's the one when the Holy Spirit quickens you and brings you back to life, never to die again. That's the one baptism. This is one also, but this is just a ritual made by man to show that we've been submerged in Jesus, raised to walk in newness of life. The baptism that saves you is when Jesus takes that dead spirit in here and he quickens it with the Holy Ghost. And for the first time, you become born again. That's what it means. Mark 1 8 says, I indeed baptize you with water, but he shall be but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist baptized with water. He dipped them in the water and said, Now you get up and turn over a new leaf now. And they did. But he told the people, Folks, I'm just dipping you in the water, baptizing you. There's another one going to baptize you. But it's the real baptism because he's going to fill you with the Holy Spirit and give you strength to come to church on Sunday morning, to give you a hunger for the Bible, to give you a desire to be with brothers and sisters in church and hear the Word of God preached. He's going to give you the want to come to church and open up that book and say, praise Him, praise Him. You know why? Because you really are praising Him. That's what the Holy Ghost will do for you. You know, there's a story in the Bible, and I've had so many people tell me, you can't have the Holy Ghost till you get baptized. You've got to get that first. Well, that's not right. There was a eunuch in the Bible that was saved. They knew he was saved. Man, that guy turned over a new leaf like you ain't never seen a different person. He got to where he was with Paul and all of them, constantly preaching and helping them. But he never got baptized. And he'd beg them. He was a eunuch, and he wasn't one of them. And I don't know, for some reason, they wasn't quick to baptize. Well, one day, they're going down in a chariot, and there's a bunch of water. And the eunuch said, can I please get baptized? Would you baptize me down there? Let me read this to you. Acts 10, 47. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Now, that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt these eunuchs in that chariot they were all saved. They all had the Holy Spirit. It done changed their lives. But they're wanting to be baptized because the Holy Spirit is compelling them to. And the apostles said, let's stop and get that done. They're saved. Why not baptize them? So we know now that's clear. But listen to in Ephesians 2, 5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ by grace, you say. When I was dead and on the road to hell, the word quicken means to bring you back to life. By the power of the Holy Ghost, I asked Jesus to save me, and he quickened me, and he brought me back to life, and then I got baptized. But he saved me, and it was all done by grace. I'd done nothing to deserve it. I did nothing to earn it. And God to this day doesn't owe me a thing. We owe him. Because you see, folks, I love this saying. We had a debt we couldn't pay. But Jesus paid a debt he didn't know. And that's why we're going to heaven today. And when we say something like, well, I'm going to heaven because I quit sinning. Or I've been baptized 15 times. I know I'm. Folks, no, you did nothing. Don't try to take the credit from Jesus. He gets the glory for saving you. All you did was say by faith, Lord, I believe you did die for me. I believe you really did rise from the dead. Save me. It's that simple. Wasn't simple for him. You know, we always talk about, boy, he suffered on a cross. Folks, he suffered way before that. This going 40 days that I eaten would have killed me. I'd have been dead in 15 days. I'd have shot myself. But nevertheless, we got a Lord that teaches us everything we need to know. And today you need to know that you're going to heaven because he loves you so much. 
that his mercy brought you grace to give you something you didn't earn or deserve. And what we do to show that we received it, we have a ritual. Rituals are good for people. We need to see it sometime. We need to touch it sometime. We need to know what's going on around us because that's just how we are. <clears throat> but you see, you walk by faith, not by sight. Today, if you've never been saved, you play in Russian roulette with yourself. I can't beg you enough, and if you could see my heart right now, you'd know how sincere I am right now. I don't want you to go to hell. Lord, I don't want none of you to go to hell. And I pray you come up here and talk to me during this invitation so you and I can pray together. I make sure you say it right. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> Tell you something, I lead you to the Lord. You found the Lord. Because this is the most serious thing in my life right here. <laughs> Being accurate with the Word of God. I want you to go to heaven. I want to show you how. I want to help you. So during the invitation, you might say, Well, Brother Russell, I, I got saved a long time ago, but I, I really don't know what I did. Do it again. Make sure that you're saved. Man, we don't play games with our soul. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You know, folks, I tell you, the Bible means so much and it says so much, but if you're not a Christian, it don't mean nothing to you. And if you're not a Christian, it only says one thing to you. One thing. You're going to spend eternity burning in the hell created for the devil and his warriors. Not a drop of water, not a bite of food. Everything bad on earth will be in hell from the flu to the mosquitoes. The Bible says there's worms there. And the worst part, you'll never get out. Never have no hope of getting out. Won't you take a minute, come talk to me, and let me show you how to get saved. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, your warnings, and being so good to us. Lord, baptism is a wonderful necessity, and we must do it to be obedient. But I thank you, Father, that when it comes to buying and earning our soul, you paid it all. You bought us with a price. What a price you paid. To see people today that hate the name of Jesus, they just don't know who they hate. Father, if there's one here that's lost, I pray right now they'll come talk with me and get saved. Father, bless this little ministry and everybody that's here today. Help us to walk close to you, to be obedient to you, and do the things that you speak to our hearts and tell us to do. Thank you for America, this great Christian nation. And we thank you for all these little country churches that still preach the truth. We thank you for men of God that love their fellow men and want to see them saved. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.